The following is a presentation of TFNN. Time to talk about your health. Living a primal lifestyle. Yeah, we have Tom on from Tampa on the phone. Hey, Tom. Good morning. It's bright and early now, huh? Hey, hey. Good. Hi, Tom. How you guys doing? Nico? Doing great. Good. Hey, uh, your newsletter is outstanding, man. I'm, I'm telling you, man, it is outstanding. And so is the Rhino Edge. I love that stuff. I'd never be without it. I mean, I've been on it now three, four months, man. I mean, it's just I can't get over how good I feel. Primal Edge is, uh, you know, people are raving about it. People who are trying it, they know because you can feel it. We'd not be without it. Call now. Toll free at one 877 Nine two seven six six four eight internationally at seven two seven four four five one zero four four. Now your hosts, Nico Dehan and Paige Clark. Good morning, I'm Nico Dehan, and welcome to Living a Primal Lifestyle, where we explore a return to a more balanced and natural wild world to recover our natural health and regain our rights and freedoms. And it's a beautiful morning in downtown St. Petersburg. It's 81 degrees and clear skies. Storms no longer around, which is very nice, folks. Please pick up our Health Signals newsletter. It uh, got a new one coming out on the 15th, so it comes out on the 1st and the 15th, follows the show. So the past uh, issue follows the past two weeks that we've been doing. Starts off with uh, what the brain senses in glucose and how the brain works with glucose. I'd also like to remind you to pick up the Primal Edge, our uh, one-shot wonders. Over 310 organic cell-ready liquid ingredients makes it easy to take. And uh, we've got a lot of plant-based stuff in here, which is really cool because this is all the nutrition you need to be healthy. It's all synthesized for you. It's easy to take, tastes pretty good, and one shot will do it for you. So I take this every single morning, and so does Paige. And Paige is not here today. She's in Tennessee getting her jaw adjusted again, so she'll be back next week. I want to start off uh, with uh, this uh, thing I saw on uh, Green Med Info talking about uh, microwaves. And if you uh, grew up, by the way, uh, Thursday is going to be my birthday. It's kind of a big one because it's uh, 75 years, and uh, all I want for my birthday is really another 75. So uh, we'll see if that happens or not. But the important thing is to be healthy at 75 and not uh, be crippled and not be sick and not uh, feel bad feeling aches and pains. I know in the last couple of weeks I've had lots of aches and pains. The storm was close, a lot of activity with the sun, and that brings out about a lot of not feeling good, and I certainly felt it doesn't uh, hurt that, uh, or doesn't help that people try to choke me at jiu-jitsu either, but uh, it's another story. Anyway, I got a nice massage yesterday. I'm feeling pretty good, but I wanted to go back a little bit. Uh, I remember in the 50s and 60s when uh, we were cooking things, most of the things we prepared were in the oven or on a stove top. You know, chicken was baked in the oven, uh, vegetables were either steamed, baked, or sauteed, and food was whole and fresh. Even a TV dinner was baked in the oven. Probably took only 15 minutes or so. And then all of a sudden, science and technology brought us the microwave oven that could heat food rapidly from about 30 seconds to maybe a couple of minutes. Now, the industry claimed that microwave cooking protects the nutrients, uh, the nutrient contents of food. And somehow, in tasting foods that came out of the microwave oven, I noticed that the a lot of times the texture changes. Uh, uh, some of it really t turns into rubber and things like that. Uh, foods cooked or reheated in microwave uh, often become rubbery and lack the uh, savory smells and uh, the flavors that came from cooking slowly and longer. Nevertheless, people really bought the convenience. I mean, we're living more in a fast-paced world. This is around the same time that women started coming into the workforce. Before that, it was one person in the household usually went to work. And of course, the schools were getting more. And not only did, uh, you know, we had grade ones through uh, eight, uh, but we also had the kindergarten and then as the women started working more and more, we had the preschool, so it became uh, more advantageous, let's say, to get food prepared a lot quicker. And of course, the convenience food that I always talk about, like the cornflakes and things like that, became part of that also because it was much faster. If the kid could pour it himself and put the milk in there and boom, you're uh, ready, set, go. So. Uh, the science, which had been supported by the food industry, had uh, continued to claim that the health benefits of a microwave cooking uh, was real. But recently, a published report uh, said they really questioned the health benefits of microwaves 
food. And does that mean that an occasional microwave uh, meal will be uh, health harmful? That's probably doubt. I doubt that. I'd say if you're doing it on a regular basis, this is where the problem comes in. And that's pretty much with everything, whether you're smoking cigarettes or the new vaping and things like that. If you're doing it on a regular basis, you're going to have problems. And with a microwave, we found this out too. And my wife and I threw our microwave out about 12 years ago. Now, three studies of hysterical food composition have shown that four, uh, that excuse me, five to forty percent declines in some of the minerals in fresh produce, and another study found a similar decline in our protein sources. In 1999, Scandinavian study of cooking asparagus spears found that microwaving caused a reduction in the vitamins. A study of garlic. As little as 60 seconds of microwave heating was enough to inactivate its uh, ala uh, alanase, which is the garlic's uh, principal active ingredient against cancer. A study published in November of 2003 issued uh, in the Journal of Scientific, the Science of Food and Agriculture found that broccoli zapped in the microwave with a little water lost up to 97% of its beneficial antioxidants. And by comparison, steamed broccoli lost only 11% or fewer of its antioxidants. Uh, there were also reductions in the uh, different compounds that make up the, uh, the fluids. But the mineral uh, levels in the broccoli seem to be remain intact. Now, a recent Australian study showed that microwave uh, cause a higher degree of protein unfolding than conventional heating. Now, I looked up protein unfolding and really couldn't find anything on it. But I'm thinking what happens is the structure itself of the protein uh, gets compromised. And I found this out. If you uh, uh, heat some uh, pizza in there, you find that the, the cheese gets very rubbery, rubbery, and I think this is what they're talking about. Uh, microwaving can destroy the essential disease-fighting uh, agents in breast milk that offer protection for your baby. In 1992, they found that microwave breast milk lost the uh, liosome enzyme activity. Uh, antibodies and it also fostered the growth of more potentially uh, pathological, uh, not pathological, pathogenic uh, bacteria. The more damage was done to the milk by microwaving than any other methods of heating. A microwave appears to uh, really, uh, it, you know, it heats it from the inside from the beginning in very high temperatures. So uh, if you're cooking uh, milk, very slow is the method that to do it. So, um, you know, I don't recommend using microwave ovens at all. Um, though, if you're going to maybe put something in for 30 seconds and you do this once a month or so, it's probably not going to hurt you. I think that it's the stuff that you do on a regular basis. Uh, additionally, microwaving creates new compounds that are not, not found in humans or in nature. We don't know yet what these compounds are doing to the body, but they are not health promoting. Eating fresh, uncooked, or minimally heated fruits and vegetables, uh, nuts, seeds, and herbs and spices are the basis of eating healthy. It says here, with whole grains and legumes, cooking them on the stovetop by boiling them and simmering them until tender is advised. For fresh food, steaming, sautéing, baking, uh, or blending in a slow uh, crock pot for soups is advised. Dairy products such as raw milk uh, from goats and cows or sheep are uh, the most nutritional rich when they're unheated. Raw and organic cheese is best to add to salads. So they just don't recommend any of this kind of stuff at all. And I think that that's a good line. We'll be right back. You know what's cool? Taking something that's good for you. Something specifically formulated to help with weight loss, better sleep, stress reduction, and the need to detox. Nico, our hunter and gatherer ancestors found all their nutritional requirements for health in their wild environment. But today, our food sources no longer contain the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients our bodies need to stay healthy and strong. That's why we need Primal Edge Daily Nutrition. It includes a special blend of ionic, soil-based vitamins, minerals, fatty, and amino acids in an easy-to-use liquid form. Primal Edge is powerful powered by highly concentrated fulvic and humic acids, nature's preferred delivery system. They have been called miracle molecules because like sunlight, air, and water, life cannot exist without them. That's right, Paige. They ensure we receive all the nutrition we need to be healthy and thrive. We, we take, take it, it every, every morning. morning. Primal Edge, formulated and approved by Nico and Paige of Living a Primal Lifestyle. Buy it today for just $89. Click on the Primal Edge banner on the front page of TFNN.com. 
TFNN is excited about our new software charting program, The Art of Timing the Trade Charts. In collaboration with Tom O'Brien and using his best-selling book, The Art of Timing the Trade, Your Ultimate Trading Mastery System, David White has programmed an outstanding piece of software that will complement any trader's methodology. Using this first-of-its-kind program, The Art of Timing the Trade Charts allows you to scan thousands of stocks for Fibonacci formation setups, including Gartley's, ABC's, Butterflies, and much more. The Art of Timing the Trade Charts is designed to help you when scouring the markets for stocks just beginning to form the trading patterns that many investors spend days, weeks, or even months searching to find. And right now, we're offering licenses available at only $79 a month. We are so confident that you're going to love this new charting software that will even give you a 30-day unconditional money-back guarantee. Don't miss out on this incredible new piece of software. Get your copy of The Art of Timing the Trade Charts today by visiting tfnn.com. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Directions Daily S&P 500 Bull and Bear Leveraged ETFs. Direction Leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. And welcome back. I'd like to remind you, pick up some Primal Edge. You know, this is really important, folks, because as uh, people are getting sick all over the place for various different reasons, this is one way you can protect yourself and make sure you get all the minerals and the, the vitamins that you need, along with all the little fatty acids and things that we always talk about. So pick this up. It's $89. comes to your door every single day if you get on subscription. And it's something I really do believe in. It's something that Paige and I worked on for a couple of years to get the right product. And this is really the one-shot wonder. It really Really does take care of everything so please do that so the next uh, subject I want to talk about is sodas and if you're still drinking sodas uh, you must have been hiding from my program because I've, I stopped uh, drinking those I, I don't I was never really a big soda drinker I maybe had one once in a little while uh, but I remember uh, I never really enjoyed it that much and uh, it was the little cokes in, in the beginning that were kind of cool but later on once I started getting into uh, thinking about health uh, back in the 60s, I dropped the sodas and uh, switched over to mostly just water. So just water is uh, coffee and tea and a little alcohol, uh, a little milk if you want to. Uh, and you're good to go. But sodas, uh, a lot of people have switched over from regular sodas to diet sodas thinking this is a better choice. Okay. And I'm here to tell you this is not the better choice. So uh, the... Um, Regular consumption of soft drinks, both sugar-sweetened uh, sugar and artificially sweetened, was associated with a greater risk of all uh, causes of death, according to the research published in the JAMA, uh, uh, Internal Medicine. People who drank two or more glasses of soft drinks per day had a higher risk of mortality than those who consumed even one glass per month less than one glass per month. So this study, one of the largest of its kind, tracked over a half a million men and women from 10 countries in Europe. Now in Europe, I know they don't drink as much sodas, but I think it's probably rising as we go. But uh, uh, it found that consumption of two or more glasses of artificially sweetened soft drinks a day was positively associated with deaths from circulatory diseases. For sugar-sweetened uh, soft drinks, one or more glasses a day was associated with deaths from digestive diseases, including diseases of the liver, the appendix, the pancreas, and the intestines. The researchers recruited people from Britain, Denmark, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, and the Netherlands, uh, and Norway, Spain, and Sweden. Quite a
a few people. You know, this was between 1992 and 2000, surveying them on the food and drink consumption. Participants were excluded if they reported incidents of cancer, heart disease, stroke, or diabetes. The mean age was 50.8 and 70.1 percent of uh, men, 50.8 men, and 71 percent of the participants were women. Uh, the similar uh, results were shown in the studies, but uh, other studies, but the researchers cautioned that elevated soft drink consumption may be a marker for overall unhealthy lifestyles. In one study, high soft drink consumers had a high or body mass index, the BMI, and were more likely to be current tobacco smokers also. That just adds to the whole thing. We made statistical adjustments in our analysis for the BMI, smoking habits, and the other mortality risks, which may have uh, biased our results. He says the researchers saw similar associations in smoker and non-smokers as well as lean and obese uh, participants, which in the case of the association between eating soft drinks and mortality is not strong enough that's influenced by smoking or even by your body mass index. The results of the study were significant, says Sarah Reinhardt. She was the lead food systems analyst for the Union of Concerned Scientists. It reinforces a fact that won't surprise people in the nutrition field. Processed food loaded with artificial ingredients will never be the magic bullet for better health, no matter how low in sugar they are. Our bodies are smarter than that. Yeah, it's uh, really, uh, I mean, soda is soda, no matter what. And I really th thought years ago that probably the uh, unsweetened kind or the ones with the uh, fake sugar in it probably were worse because of the chemical uh, that is involved in that. Of course, now we have the other thing that's in there that we didn't have back in the 50s and 60s. Sodas was just had the sugar in it. But now we have the uh, corn syrup in it, the uh, fructose. So that makes it worse. It really plays havoc with our uh, senses, uh, with the uh, ability for our body to find homeostasis. Uh, it just scrambles everything. And, you know, a lot of people who are hooked on these things are drinking five, six, seven. I know a couple of people that drink maybe a dozen of these a day. Huge, huge problem. The new European study is somewhat inconsistent with earlier findings, uh, Lieberman says. Uh, he's the director of nutrition. He said that in the new study, the risk of dying for any cause was more, more strongly linked to people who drank more diet drinks than the ones who drink the more sugary ones. So there may be an aspect of that. Uh, Carrie Peterson, who's a medical advisor to the cal uh, Calorie Control Council, which represents low and non-calorie sweeteners, said the numerous studies have proven that sweeteners used in diet sodas are some of the safest and most thoroughly studied ingredients in the food supply. Wow. The safety of low and no-calorie sweeteners has been re reaffirmed from time to time, again by leading regulatory and government agencies all around the world. But I certainly wouldn't trust that. Murphy said that they cannot rule out the possibility that artificial sweetened positive associations were influenced by unhealthy individuals switching to artificial sweetened uh, soft drinks. So there's a little pushback here, it seems like. We recognize that there's a possibility, a possible explanation for the positive associations found for artificially sweetened soft drinks. Uh, it's uh, that participants were greater at, uh, already at greater risk and that's why it looks bad. I don't think so. I think really the unsweetened is probably worse. But either way, uh, the, the smart thing to do is get off these sodas. In the United States, four cities in California, Berkeley, San Francisco, Oakland, and Albania, Philadelphia, Boulder, Colorado, Portland, Oregon, and Cook County, Illinois, have all imposed soda taxes, but more widespread efforts have been met with resistance from the soda lobby. Yeah, I guess so. Even so, the recent studies show that people are drinking less sugary drinks and opting for healthier choices. Well, that's a good thing for sure. Uh, it's all the more imperative to successfully commercialize to sex Let's see, it's all the more imperative to successfully commercialize lower sugar and less sweet beverages. There's a recognition that the consumer is involved, too. I don't know. I really think that advertising food is the wrong thing. And, and, and if you're looking at food for advertising in that aspect, you're looking at 
pretty much processed food, highly processed food. You're not going to be advertising good steaks and things like that. There might be a local chain restaurant that does that, but on a national level, you're never going to see really good food advertised. That's just not the way it works. First of all, good food costs a lot, so you don't have room in the budget for it. When you've got room in the budget for this with sugary drinks, because it costs pennies to make a bottle that they sell for whatever they sell them for, there's a big profit involved in this. And uh, I remember uh, years ago when they were talking about this on TV, the, one of the guys, the head guys of McDonald's came out and said, well, you know, uh, we think that uh, the sodas are okay because we start with clean, healthy water, and that's in every one of the sodas. So this is the way these people think. Anyway, got a lot more for you folks. Uh, I'd like to remind you, please pick up our uh, signals. Health Signals uh, newsletter comes out on the 1st and 15th of every month. It's $10 a month, so $5 an issue. Follows the show. So all the stuff I'm talking about today and last week are going to be in the next issue on the 15th. And please pick up our Primal Edge during the break. And we'll be right back. to tell you about the personal training studio that Nico is the owner and president of, Performance Training. Since 1998, Nico has trained individuals and groups to improve their health both mentally and physically. As a certified personal trainer, Nico's main focus is on demonstrating exercises correctly to avoid injury and teaching his clients how to manage their past injuries while getting the most out of their personal training sessions. The Performance Training Studio is filled with unique training equipment that enhances balance results at a faster rate while minimizing damage and discomfort. For more information, you can give Nico a call at 727-418-8740 or email him at nico at tfnn.com. Let him know you heard him on TFNN and save up to $100 on a special package just for TFNN listeners. Act today. If you're not currently using the Taz Profile Scanner when looking at setting up your trading opportunities, then your arsenal is short a mighty weapon. The Taz Profile Scanner is a standalone piece of software that instantly filters over 2,500 global financial markets such as stocks, ETFs, commodity futures, and Forex. Headed by Steve Dahl, Taz understands that in today's technological world, the use of top-flight software applications and technical analysis expertise is essential to successful trading in today's market. You also gain access to the webinar that Steve Dahl and Tom O'Brien just hosted, The Best Way to Use the Taz Profile Scanner to Profit. This webinar archive is available for all subscribers immediately upon signing up. All new subscriptions also come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to risk. Start your subscription by visiting the front page of TFNN.com today and you'll find the TAS Profile Scanner under the Services tab. Sign up today. Are you in the market for buying or selling real estate in the Bay Area, including the surrounding St. Petersburg, Tampa, and Clearwater markets? Tiger Real Estate LLC is a firm that has extensive experience in the Tampa Bay Area. Whether you're looking to sell your current property for maximum value, or you're in the market for a second home or investment property, Tiger Realty has the experience across all areas of real estate in the Tampa Bay Area to help buyers and sellers make the most informed decisions across all price levels. From the price you should be paying per square foot in certain up-and-coming areas to the type of cash flow investment properties are capable of creating, Tiger Real Estate can help you make the best decision when it comes to all areas of the market. Before you make one of the biggest decisions of your financial future, call Tiger Real Estate LLC today at 727-329-8322 or email us at tiger at tfnn.com. That's 727-329-8322. Call us today. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. Hey, welcome back to the show. <clears throat> so in the news, there's been a lot of stuff about the impossible meats, uh, the different uh, kind of non-meats that are out there. It's a big push. Uh, I heard this morning on the news that uh, KFC was thinking come out with uh, some fake chicken for them. So this is really in the news. 
So uh, non-meat uh, diets have uh, soared in popularity with many people ditching pork and beef and chicken in pursuit of health and environmental benefits and concerned about animal welfare. However, a new study shows that vegetarians and vegans may be at higher risk of stroke than meat-eating counterparts, although, for, uh, although those who don't eat meat have a lower chance of coronary heart disease, they say, according to the new paper studied in the medical journal of the BMJ on uh, Monday. That's the uh, journal. Uh, eat more plants and less meat to live longer and prove your health, the study says. It does not seem to lower the risk of heart disease it does exceed uh, it does exceed a higher risk of stroke if you look at the absolute numbers said Tammy Tong who is a nutritionist at the uh, Nullfield Department of Population Health at the University of Oxford this is the first study to look at the risk of stroke in vegetarians the research found that vegetarians and vegan have a 20 percent higher risk of stroke than meat eaters particularly uh, hemorrhagic stroke that's caused when the blood from an artery begins to bleed in the brain. This translates to three more cases of stroke per thousand over a 10-year period. The exact reasons for this higher risk found in vegetarians is not clear, she said. It's possible that it's due to very low cholesterol levels or very low level of some other nutrients. Yeah, cholesterol definitely plays a huge role. Remember, cholesterol is there to kind of to save your life, and it coats the arteries. So if we have a blood artery that is scarred and it goes up into the brain this is where you can get a stroke so uh, we have discussed uh, quite a bit with Paige about uh, the sugary lifestyle of uh, being a vegan or being a vegetarian and uh, the loss of the K2 which only comes in animal food and something that we don't make ourselves so we have to get it from animal foods and we get it from also things like butter and uh, milk and things like that but it has to be an animal product that gives it to you so this is an essential nutrient that we have to have to be healthy and it's not in any vegetables the other thing that the vegetables don't give us they don't give us all these uh, vitamins that are in there they're locked in there and it's very hard for us to digest them now I was watching a couple of different programs uh, of people who are vegetarians and I see them doing a lot of different things that uh, we normally don't see in America and uh, what they're doing is uh, um, trying to make kempi and trying to uh, you know make your um, sour your vegetables and ferment them put them in jars for long periods of time so if you look back at the history of people who are do doing this and that's mainly Japan China uh, Vietnam Korea North and South Korea these people use a lot of fermentation and they discovered this thousands and thousands of years ago because that's how they've been doing it. And most of the time, if you're looking at the real good restaurants or food providers and you go to some of these food shows and get to go back into their uh, place where they're making all this stuff, you'll find these huge, huge vats of either rice or different kinds of vegetables or seaweed in these big vats. And they uh, store them in water. A lot of times it's seawater, purified seawater. Uh, a lot of times there's salt involved in it, but they keep them in there for a long time, five, eight years, sometimes even more. So if you're doing this yourself and you're doing it just over the winter or just over the summer, it's not enough. These things things have to have that bacteria and that bacteria takes a long time. So this is the type of stuff that the indigenous people of Japan, of Korea, of all the uh, those eastern uh, countries found out many years ago because they ran out of the meat and they had to really rely on vegetarianism for their population. Large populations in India, large populations in China, even Japan had large populations on islands. And they discovered that they needed to change these vegetables because you can't eat them. Now, it's an interesting thing. I was. Uh, watching some anthropology shows and uh, we're talking about real going back ancient times going past uh, maybe when we were homo sapiens and going into homo erectus and going back even further to where Lucy was three and a half million years ago and that was where we think the first transition took place from eating what normally the apes eat which is mostly vegetarian types of stuff to cracking open a bone and getting the marrow out of it
Now, this is interesting because of two things. One, first of all, the marrow is protected by the bone and doesn't get rancid. Meat, however, gets rancid very quickly out in the desert heat. You know, out in the savanna, out in the wild, even if it's cold, it has a chance of getting that. But the fat doesn't, especially if it's a protective fat. If it's fat inside the meat, it's going to be protected, but if it's inside the bone, it's protected even more. So these uh, ancient ancestors of ours, which are really, really dense, distant relatives, I wouldn't even call them humans, but uh, they started doing that. And it wasn't really until the advent of fire that we started really consuming a lot more meat. Reason why is meat by itself is kind of like uh, plant food in a way because it's hard to digest unless it's full of fat. The fat is what digests very quickly. It's like it turns to liquid in your body. And that's why if you're eating sushi, which is about 50-50, 50 fat, 50 protein, it seems very easy to digest. But it's the protein that's the harder to digest. And if you look back to our indigenous people, even people who are living now off the land, you'll notice they're not eating a lot of muscle meat. They're eating some because they're cooking it, but they're eating the blood. They're eating the pancreas. They're eating some of the intestines. They're eating the brain. They're eating uh, the liver. They're eating all these organs that we don't use today. And this is where all this beautiful, uh, uh, healthy things are for us. And the organs that they're eating mimic what they do inside our bodies, too. They give us those bonuses. So it's really important to understand the whole process of how we evolved. And meat eating really started much more when we started having fires and we started doing those things. So the evidence is coming out that people who are switching to these plant-based foods, and you know, we're pushing more and more people into this by coming out with these studies saying this is better for you and things like that. This is not the way I would go. I'm, I'm, well, you probably know that I'm 99% meat. So uh, when we consume other than meat, it's just kind of an afterthought. It might be a little wine. It might be a little herb that we use on the uh, the uh, food itself. Sometimes we cook vegetables even too, but rarely. So we're pretty much a meat family, and uh, we try to seek out. And of course, we try to throw in these organ meats in there too. We don't do. I, I don't think we do it enough. So uh, I'm kind of. Uh, my 71st birthday coming up, so maybe we'll have some organ meats, who knows. But I think it's really important to understand the process of how we grew and how, why we're so healthy now and maybe why we're not so healthy now. And certainly that's the discussion that we're doing. If you want to be healthy, I, I think meat is the way to go. But if you want to eat vegetables, then really do your research and start finding out what our ancestors did with these vegetables in order to survive. And as we get uh, into the next segment, I'll talk a little bit more about this. So stick around, folks. Uh, during the break, please uh, pick up our Primal Edge, our One Shot Wonder, to get, get you healthy. And if you want to follow the show, and that uh, on the 1st and 15th, we have our Health Signal newsletter. Stick around. we got a lot more. You know what's cool? Taking something that's good for you. Something specifically formulated to help with weight loss, better sleep, stress reduction, and the need to detox. Nico, our hunter and gatherer ancestors found all their nutritional requirements for health in their wild environment. But today, our food sources no longer contain the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients our bodies need to stay healthy and strong. That's why we need Primal Edge Daily Nutrition. It includes a special blend of ionic, soil-based vitamins, minerals, fatty, and amino acids in an easy-to-use liquid form. Primal Edge is powered by highly concentrated fulvic and humic acids, nature's preferred delivery system. They've been called miracle molecules because like sunlight, air, and water, life cannot exist without them. That's right, Paige. They ensure we receive all the nutrition we need to be healthy and thrive. We, we take, take it, it every, every morning. morning. Primal Edge, formulated and approved by Nico and Paige of Living a Primal Lifestyle. Buy it today for just $89. Click on the Primal Edge banner on the front page of TFNN.com. 
If you're a trader in the market looking for exposure to gold or gold mining equities, then now is a perfect time to sign up for Tom O'Brien's Gold Report. The summer is over, gold is trading back above $1,500, and the 10-year treasury is hovering at around 1.5%. Tom O'Brien has been writing his weekly gold report for almost 18 years. There's no one that knows more about how the gold market trades and how gold mining equities react. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Every Monday morning, Tom Tom publishes his weekly gold report with coverage of gold, silver, bonds, the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, as well as more than 30 different mining equities. As of September 3rd, Gold Report subscribers have five active open positions with an average unrealized profit of almost 38% for each position. To see for yourself the types of profitable trades that are recommended within the Gold Report, sign up today by visiting TFNN.com. David White's newsletter, The Technology Insider, is focused like a laser on finding the next big things in technology. If you had invested only $10,000 in Microsoft in 1986, you'd have been a millionaire by 2000. Disruptive technology like Microsoft's is the key to these massive long-term profits, and The Tech Insider is the vehicle from TFNN to capitalize on these opportunities. This is the go-to newsletter that identifies, monitors, and profits on mostly little-known cutting-edge companies with great long-term prospects. David's experience is as an inventor of Emmy-winning animation products for TV and Hollywood that propelled a company public. Match that with 14 years as a full-time trader, and he's uniquely qualified to guide you through the light-speed world of ever-evolving high-tech. If you're ready to ride the next big technology bull market for less than $40 per month, log on to TFNN.com and get your two-week free trial to the Technology Insider. Get in on the ground floor of the next big thing today. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV for the latest market information. Welcome back, folks. Uh, so I've talked about the sun quite a bit uh, in past shows and talked about the grand solar minimum that we think is coming. And there's an announcement by uh, NASA in the press release dated... Uh, June 9th, uh, 2019, NASA described the upcoming decline in solar activity as a window of opportunity for space exploration instead of acknowledging the disastrous consequences of such a decline would have on our civilization. Uh, the sun's activity rises and falls in an 11-year cycle. The forecast for the next solar cycle says it will be the weakest in the last 200 years. This is by NASA. The maximum of the next this nice cycle measured in terms of sunspot numbers, a standard of sun, uh, uh, sun solar activity, could be 30 to 50 percent lower than the recent one. The result shows that the next cycle will start in 2020, reaches maximum in 2025. Sunspots are reasons uh, are regions in the sun with magnetic fields thousands of times stronger than the Earth's. Fewer of them at a point of maximum solar activity means fewer dangerous blasts of radiation. <clears throat> the research is led by a research group in the Bay Area Environmental Research Institute at NASA's Ames Research Center in uh, California, Silicon Valley. <clears throat> In admitting that the solar activity during sunspot cycle 25 will be weakest in 200 years, NASA was effectively forecasting a return to the Dalton minimum, which is the 1790 to 1830 conditions. But the release gives no mention of the uh, cold, no mention of the crop losses, no mention of the ensuing starvation and famine, and no mention of the war over food, no mention over the powerful earthquakes, no mention of the volcanic uh, eruptions during the Dalton minimum. <clears throat> There's a chart here that shows you the activity and when it was warm. Now this goes back, uh, let's see, to about 2500 B.C. If you're looking at this chart, you can see the cold is at least equal. I think it's more than the warm. We're in these cold segments uh, most of the time a lot longer. This goes on only to 2500 BC. If we go back to 12,000 years, that's when the last large ice age took place. And we really don't know a lot about history past this 2500 year point. We don't even know who was alive during then. Uh, it was before the Romans, before the Greeks, and uh, it's really stories from the Bible that I think connect us to this time. 
But you can see this is the current cycle and we're going downhill. And uh, this is the Dark Ages here. This is the uh, Grecian uh, Empire cold. These warm periods here, this was the min medieval warm period during the Renaissance years. The Little Ice Age came, shut that whole thing down, and then the Industrial Revolution right here during this hard time. Then we had this Little Ice Age, and then we had this big warm period, which we're in now. And we're, we don't know how far down we're going to go in this, but I think it's important. They said the real issue is global warming. And they're thinking that uh, the shorter growing seasons and this food disruption uh, could be from the cold. Who knows? We don't know this yet. But it's uh, kind of an interesting. One of the things I want to do is kind of go over what some of these things mean when we're talking about the sun. And I've got something here. Let's see if I can find it. This is the modern minimum or the little ice age that they're talking about on this one. And they give you some nice facts. So uh, our burning star may seem like it's a constant ball, always looking the same. However, it's like planet Earth. The sun has weather. It has storms. It has storms that affect Earth's weather. And here are some of the features. And they talk about the sunspots and things. So let me go up to that to capture that for you. There you go. So sunspots are these dark, cool spots on the sun. Think of them as caps on a magnetic storm that is brewing just below the solar surface. So the sun's magnetic fields are moving around, getting twisted and concentrated in these regions. So sunspots are really little tornadoes, uh, little hurricanes are large in this case because they're larger than we are as far as planet Earth is concerned. Solar flares appear as flashes of light on the sun that are associated with sunspots. Occasionally, when powerful magnetic fields reconnect, they explode and break through the sun's surface. There's a sudden burst of light energy and x-rays. Flares are classified according to their strength. The smaller ones are B-class, followed by the C, the M, and the X, which is the largest. M-class flares uh, can cause like uh, bra uh, radio blackouts at the poles, minor radio storms that might endanger even astronauts. Now, coal uh, coronal mass ejections, CMEs, are massive clouds of particles that spread into space. Large pieces of magnetic energy are hurled from the sun into planetary space at speeds several million miles per hour. CMEs can occur with filaments, uh, and they become unstable, and they fly away from the sun. We call this filament an eruption. Other solar events include, include the solar wind streams that come from the coronal, the coronal holes and the solar uh, energy particles, which are caused by the CMEs. Now, how does this affect Earth? Now, sunspots affect both weather and technology, which is why we're really dependent on this technology here. So uh, GPS, uh, satellites, and other high-tech systems in space are affected by the active sun. Some of these systems are not protected by the atmosphere. So large solar flares have the potential to cause billions of dollars in damage to the world's high-tech infrastructure, from GPS uh, navigation to the power grids, to air travel, and to the financial systems also. Uh, there's also radi radiation hazards for astronauts. They can be caused by the quiet sun. Remember, when the sun is quiet, it's not throwing that solar wind towards us. And that means that the solar wind is kind of buffering our atmosphere to give it breath. So the atmosphere is getting larger and larger. And th this is important because when our atmosphere is large, we get lots of protection, not only from CMEs from the sun, but also from the cosmic rays from other suns, other stars. So weather on Earth can be affected. Uh, according to the uh, old uh, farmer's almanac, NOAA scientists have now concluded that four factors determine global temperatures. Carbon dioxide levels, uh, volcanic eruptions, the P Pacific El Nino pattern, and the sun's activity. Climate change, including long periods of global cold, rainfall, drought, and other when, uh, weather effects are influenced by the solar cycle activity. So what is the solar cycle? So here we have a solar cycle, and let's see which one this was. This was 1980. 
to 86 was the, ma the minimum in 1989 maximum again. So they started with the maximum here with lots of sunspots. They go down a minimum, you see no sunspots and you go back up. By solar minimum, we mean the lowest number of sunspots. After some years of high activity, the sun will ramp down with fewer spots or almost no spots. The temperature cools. Conversely, solar maximum is the high uh, number of sunspots given any cycle. A new cycle will start with a solar maximum uh, littered with sunspots and solar storms. And then the temperature warms. As the cycle can overlap, it can be challenged to predict when the next cycle starts. And that's kind of what we're doing now. We're trying to figure it out. Now the modern minimum or the Little Ice Age, was between 1645 and 1750. <clears throat> the modders are the ones that counted the sunspots, and so that's why we got the name. And there were only about 50 sunspots during that, uh, uh, those uh, hard years, and usually we have 40 to 50,000, so you can see how the activity is. I got uh, up on a break, I'll be right back. I'm certain you are or strive to be one of the best of the best at everything you do in life. It's the most common trait that we tigers and tigresses share. If you're looking to become the best of the best when it comes to managing your money, let me teach you to do what most wealth managers tell you can't be done, which is how to time the markets. I'm Steve Rhodes, author of Mastering Probability, and for the last 12 months, Timer Digest has been tracking my newsletter signals, which have earned me the ranking as their number one market timer in the nation for the S&P 500 for the last 12 six and three months timer digest also ranks me as the number one market timer for gold as well the fact is markets can be timed and i'll teach you the exact set of tools that i use that has transformed me into one of the best at what i do sign up for mastering probability today by clicking on the newsletter tab on the homepage of tfnn.com and get immediate access to workshops where i take you step by step how to use an extraordinary set of tools as well as provide great market calls too. sign up today Hi folks, Tom O'Brien here. If you'd like to get my daily newsletter, Market Insights, then now is a great time to sign up for a 30-day free trial. Every morning by 9.30, I send out my morning letter to subscribers with market commentary on a variety of markets, currencies, and commodities to keep investors up to date on the day's trading action. Included in Market Insights are specific buy and sell recommendations for stocks, ETFs, and even options, with stops and price targets included for every trade in my newsletter. If you'd like to try my newsletter risk-free for 30 days, then head over over to the front page of TFNN and you'll find market insights under trading newsletters. I use my years of trading experience to bisect and dissect the market every morning and give my subscribers the most important information they need to know for the day ahead. I even issue afternoon updates for my subscribers whenever warranted with important market action. I'm always scouring the market for the next great trading opportunity. Sign up for your 30-day free trial to my daily newsletter, Market Insights, today by visiting the front page of TFNN.com. Wow! Go get them, folks! TFNN has put together the best lineup of live content for traders by traders every market day, featuring some of the most knowledgeable and respected minds in the business. TFNN broadcasts five days a week live from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We have live programming every market day during market hours. Every morning, Larry Pesavento kicks off the trading day live at 9 a.m. and breaks down the opening bell with Trade What You See. At 10 a.m., Tom and Tommy O'Brien host the TFNN Bull Bear Trading Hour, followed at 11 a.m. by the team at TD Ameritrade and Thinkorswim with Fast Market. Basil Chapman hosts the Tiger Technicians Hour at noon, Steve Rhodes at 1 p.m. with the Trader's Edge, Dave White at 2 p.m. with the Power Trading Hour, and Tom O'Brien anchors the daily lineup from 3 till 5 as host of the Tom O'Brien Show. Tune in to TFNN's Tiger TV on your computer or mobile device, and you can always find us streaming on YouTube. TFNN.com, educating investors. Hey, welcome back to the show. So talking about the sun and things like that, uh, I've often mentioned the disaster cycle and how the earth goes through a lot of these different uh, disasters uh, just because of the weather. And, uh, you know, people have been living underground on planet earth for quite a while. And if you go to places like Turkey and Italy, you'll find vast areas of underground. And of course, in the United States, we have that too. But now the Pentagon has put out a query. We would like to borrow your underground layer, if that's cool, for research. So they're trying to get a list together. And this was brought out by DARPA. Research. Uh, 
Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, better known as DARPA. <clears throat> they want to know where underground stuff is. So a lot of museums, of course, the underground in different cities like New York that have subways have vast undergrounds, and they want to get a sense of where these are and how they can manage these. And of course, we think there's a lot of underground being built uh, in uh, Cheyenne Mountain area under the Denver Airport, all the way going into Wyoming. Uh, there's lots of reports of vast, vast areas of. Uh, underground. So uh, if you have an underground, DARPA wants to know about it. But I would say keep quiet and keep it for yourself because if you have an underground, that's your hiding place. That's the place to go if there are problems uh, uh, with whatever. You know, uh, you need a safe place to be. And caves and things like that, I think, have uh, come and saved our life for many, many years. And uh, if you have a place like that, keep it to yourself, I say, and don't give it to the government. Same with uh, food. If you're hoarding food and things like that, don't tell people about it. Because as soon as there's a disaster, it's the authorities that want that food so they can distribute it to who they want to distribute it to. Uh, they want to be the single source of food, and they've already done that. I big infrastructure is designed in such a way that they bring us the food. We used to follow the food. Now we have to follow our government and these big industries for the food. It's much, much safer if we do food on an individual basis in our area locally with the local indigenous food. This is the way I see it. And if you have an underground bunker that, that our government would like to see, I would say keep it to yourself. But there's a lot of this uh, on. There was another article I found here and all. Of course, this will be going into the next newsletter. Uh, where is that other one? Here's another one with uh, FGov. Underground experimentation request for information, the federal business opportunities. Anyway, <clears throat> we'll dig into that a little bit farther. Paige will be back next week. Thanks a lot for sticking around, and uh, you have a great week out there. Bye-bye.